Good morning, Sabanas. How are you? Good morning to you, Yoni. I'm very pleased to hear you're fully recovered. Thank you so much. It's so lovely to see you. Ladies and gentlemen who are joining us, let me introduce you to Sir Bernard Ricks. Sir Bernard Ricks is a former English judge and was a Lord Justice of Appeal from 2000 to 2013. Correct, yes. But most importantly, is a friend and member of St. John's Wood Synagogue. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> it's really wonderful to have this opportunity to speak to you um, and thank you for giving us your time. Perhaps you could just begin by showing us a little bit about your relationship and connection with St. John's with Synagogue. When did you become a member? How many years have you been a member? And tell us a little bit about that. I think that's lost in history, but uh, uh, I do believe that my, my mother's father, my grandfather, was a member of the, the shul uh, a very long time ago. I mean, wow. perhaps, perhaps going back to the... the um, well, he started life in the East End and then he went to Golders Green and then he moved to the West End. So it would be before the war in the, uh, in the 1930s or 40s. Uh, but at any rate, I have been a member of the shul since I moved to St. John's Wood, which would be in my teens or thereabout. That's a long wow. time ago now. Wow. Uh, and tell me something else. Tell me, how, how are you doing at the moment with this, obviously, this very difficult situation? How, how are you personally, the family, your parents-in-law, Lord Young? How's everyone doing? Well, we're very glad that my, um, my parents-in-law, David and Lita Young, uh, well, we, we might say were sent off to the country, but at any rate, sent themselves off to the country, and they've been sheltering in the country uh, since before the lockdown, and um, they took with them uh, all the food that they had prepared uh, in readiness for a big traditional family seder. So wow. they have got their lockdown with 22 portions of chicken soup and 22 <laughs> portions of marrow and 22 <laughs> portions of kharoset oh, wow. and everything. And they're gradually I, don't know if I'd recommend, I don't know if I'd recommend 22 portions of Mara, but um, when <laughs> I, I actually phoned them to see how they're doing and I spoke to their assistant who said they do not need any provisions for Passover, so that explains why not. <laughs> <laughs> so they're okay, so they're okay, thank God. Um, uh, we are sheltering here in St. John's Wood with my youngest daughter, Rachel, whom I think you, you know, oh. Yoni, oh. and who sends her regards to you. Um, thank you. She works for an Israeli company. Right. And they all got together from all over the world uh, in oh, February really? in Tel Aviv. Oh, wow. and, 40, and 40 of them came back ill. And they just wonder yeah. whether, whether really? that they were early sufferers of, of a virus. Well, well I, I hope she has it very mildly. And I wish you all very, very well. We're living in very unusual times. And um, I would like to really talk to you this morning a little bit about your um, thoughts about some of the legalities of what's going on. I know the government have issued quite strong advice and there's a bit of a grey area where government advice and law perhaps uh, cross a little bit and I wondered what your reflections were on that. I know we've seen over the weekend particularly a lot of people who've been breaking the lockdown rules. That's been happening unfortunately. We as a community have been urging everyone to follow it rig rigorously, stay home, What's your views of where, where law becomes advice and advice becomes law in the grey area? Um, very, good, very good question. Um, I don't quite know exactly what is law and, and what is not. Uh, I understand that uh, the other week um, when the Prime Minister announced the lockdown, uh, which was Monday a week ago, today, today a fortnight ago, yes, um, a 360-page uh, statute was passed in Parliament in record time and pursuant to the statute there are uh, very long regulations uh, which have uh, been promulgated and they are law but what's in the 360 pages I'm not I'm not 100% certain so uh, a, a good guess is that the requirement that uh, all uh, shops, other than shops selling food uh, or restaurants selling takeout food, uh, 
which have been shut down uh, that's that's law i mean that's that's my understanding i mean how else how else would you do how else would you do it so far as the personal lockdown is concerned whereby we are all told to stay in our homes and can only go out to buy food as infrequently as possible to exercise but only once a day um, and not to go to work unless it's absolutely essential yeah. Uh, I have a feeling that that is also covered by law, but I do not know. I mean, one would have to go into those 360 pages to find out and to find out in exactly what words and terms it's provided for. And part of the confusion is that when we hear uh, spokesmen for the government on those um, daily uh, programs at 5, 5 p.m. or thereabouts, very often the government minister talks about guidance or advice mm. rather than law and i think i think that it may well be law that it, it goes beyond guidance or advice uh, one can well understand why it's spoken of as guidance or advice um, and in a way it's been quite clear from the outset that the government have been very reluctant in this country to use the law to enforce a lockdown because we are a country that believes in in liberty sure. and M many would say that it's really infringed on our civil liberty well, it, pl it plainly does in extraordinary ways in in ways which uh, you would have to go back to wartime i suppose to find anything like it so um although i often describe myself particularly to my children as a war baby because i was just born in 1944 i um don't remember i don't remember the war uh, <laughs> although i remember i remember rationing after the war when i couldn't buy the sweets that i wanted to buy and we were all rationed to a little bit of orange juice in a medicine bottle i can remember that you know you're much too much too young to remember uh, any of that but um but plain, plainly there was law and i remember when during the oil crisis in the early 1970s we uh i think we we hovered on the brink of of petrol rationing we were all issued with petrol ration books but i don't think it actually quite came into effect but we almost we almost got to petrol rationing in the 1970s. Um, uh, but this is quite unique in, uh, in, in, in my experience and very, very far reaching. Um, I believe that the requirements that we stay in our home with the exceptions which I mentioned uh, is law but I'm not 100% certain. Mm. I think and that's, also, why, that's why the police are, are out there in as charming a way as possible, as they keep on telling us, to remind us of our obligations. Sure. I, I think the coronavirus itself raises loads of ethical, moral questions about surveillance, uh, questions about life and death, about how doctors make decisions in hospitals. Um, and various other ethical issues that, that come up. And I, I just wondered if you had any reflections on some of those very, very difficult decisions that, um, that we are facing now as a society. Well, these are decisions about life and death as well as about uh, liberty uh, and uh, how you treat your fellow citizens. So it, it, it ranges from decisions of life and death, uh, which I'm not sure we have quite reached yet i mean if we were to run out of uh, of um, intensive care beds or or uh, respirators and ventilators a situation which i don't think that we have reached yet although you can never be sure about what situation is in particular places then uh, the doctors have to make a, a decision about who who gets the treatment or who gets the respirator and we have heard news of 
situations like that happening in Italy, for instance, which has been struck even worse than we have been. But I'm not sure we've reached that situation in this country, and please God, we, we won't. But we have heard uh, on our televisions of, of um, decisions that, that, that um, are having to be taken about who gets tested for the virus before other people. So apparently there's a shortage of tests because of a shortage of swabs or, or reagents, which we've heard about. And therefore, uh, guidelines or some such decisions have had to be taken as to who gets tested first. And the decision on the whole has been that patients should be tested before medical staff. And one can understand that, of course, how that would be in line with the finest traditions of the medical service. And although, although one can well understand that m medical staff who have symptoms of one kind or another wish to be tested so that they know that if they're free of the virus, they can get back to treating patients and, and working uh, and um, doing, doing their, their job in that way, which they're very anxious to do. Um, nevertheless, they have been prevented from getting all the tests that they would like by a government decision or, or a government medical decision to give preference to patients. One right. can understand decisions of this kind having, having to be made. Thank God they're not in themselves life and death decisions. Although, of course, if you, if you um, prefer to give the tests to the patients so that you know exactly how to treat them, that may well ultimately be a decision which bears upon life and death because you're ensuring that the best possible treatment can be given to the patients. So these decisions are with us. Um, the government is having to take very difficult, difficult moral decisions as to how and to what extent and how best to infringe our liberties for the safety of us all. Um, and then there are difficult decisions which uh, are partly moral and ethical, but partly a matter of um, utilitarian judgment about how best to put over to the population at large the restrictions which need to be imposed upon us. I mean, when you say that people can go and exercise once a day, so people go to the, people go to the park. My wife and I, Karen and I, have been exercising once a day as we've been allowed by going for a walk to Regent's Park, which as we know here in St John's Wood lies on our doorstep and it's a very nice place to walk. Well, over the weekend it, it got quite busy, right? So there's a whole new etiquette about how you take your exercise in the park. And on the whole, it's noticeable how people have learnt the etiquette. So you walk down a pathway. Pathway is a little busier than it might be if, if you were the only people there, right? So two people or two pairs of people walk towards one another on the pathway. In ordinary times, they might walk quite close to one another as they pass, yeah. either, either approaching one another or, or, or overtaking one another. But now you zigzag. You zigzag from one side of the path to the other side of the path, or even go onto the grass in order to keep your socially prescribed distance of two meters from one another, right? Yeah. Sure. And well, on the children, whole, my children like to paddle the dogs as well as they walk down the path. <laughs> <laughs> and on the and on the whole, people people do that, and we've learned the etiquette of that quite quickly, and one can see how one does that. Um, but some people don't do that, and on the whole. Actually, it's the younger people who don't do it. The young people walk down the centre of the path, leaving no room to pass on either side without going into the grass and to the undergrowth. <laughs> and they haven't learned the etiquette as quickly as perhaps some of the older people do. And the, these are quite interesting things to observe. Sure. Um, sure. Let me ask you. Let me ask you the following. You know, uh, clearly, 
things are changing, etiquette's changing, we are changing. I mean, the synagogue has adapted hugely. We, we're doing a lot of services online and various classes online. In what way has the judiciary, the House of Lords, the, the courts, how have they adapted to these times? Obviously, there's a lot of court cases that must have been uh, compromised and uh, delayed because of what's going on. Do you have any insight into how that's going in your professional life? I, I've, I've heard bits and pieces. I mean, I'm not, I'm not in that world anymore. I did my last sitting as a retired uh, uh, member of the Court of Appeal just before my 75th birthday last December. In fact, I sat in the last week of my 75th year, just before I turned 75. It was very nice to do so because I was entitled to go back until I was 75, even after my retirement. And I did that regularly. So until last December, I, I was there uh, off and on. Now, not anymore. I have heard that the Supreme Court, as we would call the the most senior court now, not the House of Lords, the, the, the Supreme Court, have been sitting, uh, hearing cases uh, online uh, by... Um, similar technology to this. Similar technology to this. And uh, they have either been working uh, with e-files or possibly they've been working with hard copy files in their own homes, wherever they are. Mm -hmm. And I think that as far as possible, the courts have, until quite recently, been continuing to operate as best they can with the use of, of technology. As things have got more and more difficult, I'm not sure how much uh, that um, has continued. I heard a few weeks ago that the Lord Chief Justice uh, said that all jury trials of more than three days, I think he said, would be adjourned, but jury trials of up to three days would continue. But that was before the, the lockdown. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that any courts are continuing to sit, I don't think they are, in person. Uh, they, they are continuing as best they can online, but quite how much of that is being done, I don't know. Now, in, in my current world, which is that of arbitration, pri private judging, uh, commercial arbitration, um, until we get to a final hearing, most of our work is, is done online. Uh, we correspond with one another by, by email, and we give directions by email. If we need um, interlocutory conferences, we do that as much as possible by telephone conferences. Um, even even without the this new zoom technology of seeing one another and I suspect that um, with the insight that we've received in in these last few weeks we will do more of those telephone conferences by zoom so we can actually see each other as well as hear one another and that's possible for a conference of an hour or so now there is talk of uh, actual final hearings being conducted uh, online. I haven't participated in, in one yet. Um, there are people who have no difficulty in finding their way around e-files. You, you would need, of course, two screens, wouldn't you? Uh, sure. You would need a, scre a screen for the video and you'd need a screen to get the documents up. Um, and if you are familiar with all this technology and you can work it quickly enough, I think that that is a perfectly satisfactory way of proceeding and I have heard of final hearings which have continued in that way. I haven't done one myself yet, I'm a little little fearful but you know we all we all have to learn new sure. tricks. <laughs> um, I have a couple of, um, I, had a, I had one arbitration at the end of March that's been adjourned, I had one in April that's been adjourned and I have one in May that's been adjourned. I have now two arbitrations in Singapore coming up in the first half of June and we're trembling on the brink of deciding what to do with that and I'm not quite sure whether they'll be adjourned or whether we will transfer them into e-hearings and if we transfer them into e-hearings I will have to learn how good a dog I am with new tricks. Mm. Well, I'm sure you'll do very well. I've got one final question and then I will let you go. 
you know, you are a very, very um, well-loved member of the community. We enjoy very much when you do a Haftarah and you're a man of faith. You come to shul quite regularly. How, how do you think people's faith or your own personal faith, if, if you wish, is affected by what we are going through? And how do you think synagogue life might change in the post-corona world? What an interesting question. Well, I, I, think, I think it is helpful to be a person of, of faith. Um, I think that helps to believe that uh, all, will be, all will be all right and that we can even learn good lessons out of our very difficult circumstances. I can't quite put myself in the position of someone who has no faith. And, um, in, in, the, in the shul community, I mean, we are learning new ways of doing things and I think this will be very helpful in the end. I think we will see we will use we will use uh, the new technology uh, more, and we will be able to join with one another uh, in more ways and do more things together. Well, I do th I do think that we will learn from these difficult situations new ways of doing things, and that this will be an advantage in the end. It will bring us uh, together more, and we will share th more things together, and that is very nice for our community in our lovely St. John's Wood Shul. And I, I look forward to, to doing things more together in this I way. look forward to seeing you back in Shul very soon. I wish you and your family a happy Passover and a healthy one. And do you have any closing message to the community? Well, I've enjoyed doing this. I think it's a brilliant idea, Yoni, well done. I look forward to being with everyone in Shul, again, in, in good health and in happy t happier times. And I wish everyone a very, very happy and healthy Pesach. So Bernard Ricks, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Yo.